Rome had despised and feared Emperor Tiberius, but nothing he had ever done in his lifetime would prove to be as horrendous as his failure to prevent Caligula from taking his place after his death. The Viper, the Mad Emperor, was a ticking time bomb. At the start of Caligula's reign at the helm of the Roman Empire, he was described as being beloved by all in the world, from the rising to the setting sun. The Roman people were so overtly enthusiastic about the death of Tiberius that they would have likely adored any successor who seemed at the very least to be an okay human being. Caligula particularly also had the advantage of being a son of the treasured Germanicus, and in the early months of his rule, he was fairly mild and cheerful. He portrayed himself as generous, playful, and a lavish spender in a way that also seems to benefit the public. The new emperor was putting on extravagant gladiatorial games and handing out money to both the peasant class and the aristocracy for no obvious reason. He gave new honors and privileges to his surviving relatives and lay his decease to rest at the Mausoleum of Augustus. The citizenry saw a fun, compassionate, and kind ruler in place of the former solemn and dark Tiberius, and this made Caligula even more popular. But if fame couldn't go to the man's head, it would be his illness, seven months into his reign, that did. In the fall of 37 AD, Caligula became severely unwell with anything from an epileptic attack to poisoning to some sort of psychotic break. Whatever the ailment was, it became so grave that the Roman people believed their emperor was on his deathbed and thus wept and lamented the presumed loss of their so loved ruler. It is said that even some senators prayed for the man's recovery, asking the gods to take them instead of Caligula. Thankfully for their sake, the emperor would survive, and so would they. But something was not quite right anymore. Caligula had changed not just physically. With the illness's departure, it appeared that part of the emperor's sanity had gone with it. The year after his near-death experience, Caligula threw all Roman precedent aside when he defied his recently deceased sister Drusilla, whom he had loved so dearly that many spoke whispers of a possible incestual relationship. He furthermore seemed to have already forgotten about his earlier decision to do away with the unjust and political trials and executions of his predecessor, and now Caligula too was happily ending lives for so much of the slightest slip-up. Even the Praetorian commander and former friend of the Emperor Macro seemed to displease Caligula by simply holding notable enough power for the changed ruler to feel threatened. Macro, along with Gemellus, Tiberius's intended co-heir, was forced to commit suicide. Some speculate that the leading motive for the sudden uptick in executions was more to do with garnering public funds than with Caligula's newfound depraved lunacy. But this may not have always been the case. Still, the emperor was known to seize estates upon execution, institute new taxes, and utilize many other forms of income after 39 AD brought about an undeniable financial crisis caused by Caligula's earlier spending. Of course, not everything that the emperor did was suddenly wrong. Some of Caligula's public reforms were quite liked, such as his decisions to publish accounts of public funds, something that Tiberius had refused to do. He also went on campaigns in both Gaul and Germany, which accomplished all but nothing. There was such an absence of success and battle, in fact, that Caligula ordered his men to gather seashells on the beach which would be displayed as spoils of victory. This was scarcely the strangest thing that the Mad Emperor did, however. 
For one, it said that Caligula enjoyed utterly terrorizing the Senate, even joking with the men that his horse would be as good a consul as any of the recent picks. This wasn't as bad as the way he would make some senators run alongside his chariot for miles. But this even was still better than what he allegedly did to a priest's assistant. It's remarks that during an animal sacrifice, the emperor intentionally brought the mallet down on the innocent man instead of the animal he was holding in place. It's also said that Caligula rather enjoyed reminding people, including his own wife, that he could have them murdered at any time if he only said the word. He cherished watching people suffer, and the caring, fun old Caligula was dying more and more as every sun set and rose. Countless stories exist of Caligula's dwindling sanity. Others, though not violent, show his deeply self-centered nature, such as his decision to gather so many merchant ships to create a bridge across the Bay of Baiae that there was a grain shortage and limited famine. The reason why the emperor did this is said to have been because of a prophecy, which had stated that Caligula would no more become emperor than he would drive his chariot across the Bay of Baiae. Thus, the bridge was created, and Emperor Caligula pompously rode across the bay, back and forth, for hours on end. He also hoped so deeply to become a god that he simply defied himself. Caligula ordered his own statues and temples to be built. Despite minor successes in expanding the Roman Empire and managing revolts, it appears that no one remembers much aside from the accusations of insanity, sexual perversion, adultery, violence, sadism, betrayal, and so much more. Many of the citizenry, both peasantry and nobility, were growing tired of Caligula's new form already. There had already been one conspiracy to take down the emperor, led by his brother-in-law, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. Lepidus was executed, but that had done nothing to stop the rapidly growing resentment toward the man who so much of Rome had had such high hopes for. On January 24, 41 AD, while out enjoying the festivities at the Palatine Games in the Cryptoporticus, Cassius Shiaria, with the support of his fellow Praetorian guardsmen and some of the Senate whom Caligula had so ruthlessly bullied and bruised, pulled out a whetted blade and brought it down, slicing directly into the Emperor's flesh. A mob of supporters briskly joined in, revealing their own knives to stab Caligula again and again. The Mad Emperor, born Gaius Julius Caesar, was dying a death eerily similar to that of his namesake. A conspiracy led by a man named Cassius and resulting in over 30 stab wounds once more killed a Caesar. The immediate aftermath of the assassination was chaotic. Some, such as Chirea, hoped for the armed forces to collectively support the Senate, but the Praetorian Guard in particular was hesitant, knowing that their existence relied heavily on the reigning of an emperor. Thus, while the anti-imperial faction sought out Caligula's wife Caesonia and their one-year-old daughter Julia Drusilla, the Praetorians scoured the palace for their new emperor. Caesonia was killed, and her daughter's head was violently smashed against a wall until she, too, was passed. Meanwhile, the guardsmen, specifically one by the name of Gratus, ripped aside a palace curtain to find the cowering and desperate Claudius, uncle to Caligula, and the last man anyone would expect to inherit the Roman Empire. And yet, without hesitation, the Praetorian Guard decided this was their new emperor. Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus was born on August 1st, 10 BC, to Antonia Minor. He was the grandson of Mark Antony and Emperor Augustus' sister Octavia, the younger brother of the hero Germanicus. 
In his early years, young Claudius began to show signs of physical disability, one that many scholars have now theorized to be cerebral palsy. Claudius struggled with symptoms such as tremors, a stammer, a limp, and other noticeable ailments. As a sad consequence of his time and familial status, the young boy quickly became the target of ridicule and neglect from his own relatives due to his disability. As he aged, despite his symptoms becoming less overbearing and his growing knowledge and oratory skills thanks to tutoring from Livy and Sulpicius Flavus, Claudius still fails to earn a proper chance in the eyes of his family. Too soon, he chose to begin writing a dangerously honest account of Rome's civil wars, which, for Augustus, was far too critical. His sister, Claudius' mother, intervened in the matter and prevented the work from being completed. It seems that as the years went on, the family's disgust towards the young man only grew, and one could scarcely tell that Claudius was even part of the family at all. Even as control of the empire shifted to Tiberius, there came no allowance for Claudius to enter public life at all. Ironically, the Senate and other members of Roman citizenry seemed to be quite fond of Claudius, whether it was in opposition to the imperial family or simply because they liked the man, it likely varied, but nonetheless, it would be blatantly false to say that Claudius was abhorred by all. And even within his family, Claudius would find an unexpected ally in Caligula. It would be the mad emperor who would finally break Claudius into the political realm, making him co-consul in 37 AD. Of course, Caligula enjoyed taunting and torturing everyone within eyesight or earshot, and Claudius was no exception to this sadistic hobby. But he nevertheless was finally getting the opportunity he'd been wanting. When the assassination plot against Caligula was being discussed, according to some historians, Claudius was well aware of it, and simply did nothing to stop it. Having departed from the games shortly before Caligula was attacked, however, Claudius quickly realized that the imperial German bodyguard, remaining faithfully loyal to their emperor, was taking down anyone that seemed even slightly connected to the conspiracy. Meanwhile, it was rapidly becoming glaringly obvious that on the other end, Cassius was determined to wipe out Caligula's family entirely. This led Claudius on the run, ending up in the palace where Gratus found him cowering behind the curtain. But the Praetorians weren't there to kill him. They were there to name him Princeps and rush him off to safety under their own protection. The Senate was now reluctantly forced to confirm Claudius as the new ruler of the Roman Empire. <laughs>